Welcome everybody to another game dev roundtable here on Game Wisdom, where some of the art and science of games. We have another very interesting chat lineup for our month's topic. We're going to be discussing metagame design, all the confusing terminology that goes with it, and what does it mean as a developer to either build or manage your game around it. But before we get to that, as always, we're going to give our roundtable a chance to introduce themselves. So I'll start with myself, and then we'll go kind of clockwise around. I am again Josh Beiser from Game Wisdom. I talk way too much about game dev and game design. I have played just about all indie games ever released, and I am a multi-book uh, or multi-published author with multi with wow. Mouth is dying there. Multi-published author with multiple books on design, including the Game Design Deep Dive series and 20 Essential Games to Study. But I'll throw it over to Rob. Hello, uh, my name is Rob Leach. I've been in games in some capacity or other uh, as a producer, tester, and designer for uh, a little over 20 years now. Just hit that 20-year mark. Um, in a wide variety of uh, different game companies and game types and genres. Most recently, I've been working for 2K on the NBA 2K series, um, but that's uh, that's kind of me in a nutshell. I'll uh, I'll pass the the potato on though. All right, to Seth. Hey, I'm Seth Goldberg, also uh, known as the Strategy Informer. I uh, been around the gaming industry for longer than I I can even count, um, and also the IT industry. I've been in pretty much every role in game design except art um 3d that type of thing ran my own studio my claim to fame is working on ultima online and some of the original mmos like ashron's call um uh, lord of the rings online etc so forth all right and to ramin uh, my name is ramin shokrizad uh my handle is sarsrock i've been writing about um game economics since the year 2000 uh, and and uh, uh, since about 2005, I attempted to create a field called that. Um, and uh, I guess I would be credited with having created the uh, metagame design for some games like uh, World of Tanks Blitz, World of Warships, and uh, um, now I'm a co-founder of a, of a uh, AAA company, which is very much focused more um, on meta gameplay. We call it, we consider ourselves a transmedia company, uh, and the name of that company is called Aravant. All right. So this is definitely a very interesting topic, and I think when I pitched it, I was thinking more about meta in terms of like persistent elements, but meta as a term or meta game design as a term. It definitely hit different things, and we're having a huge discussion, or a little bit of a discussion, on our little Discord thread about trying to figure out what exactly is metagame. So I think the first question then for the roundtable then is, when we talk about the metagame or metagame design, what does that mean? So anyone want to start first? Feel free. Yeah, I, I might as well, because... You know, I'll cover the ground that we covered in the Discord. Mm -hmm. So, metagame originally came about in about the late 40s and uh, became a scientific application for um, psychological studies. Uh, they were trying to determine what were the best results of various things. Over the years, that got brought into game theory and uh, um, things like the Nash equivalent. Uh, Nash equilibrium, my mouth is not working either, and finding out, you know, the best solutions to things like the prisoner's dilemma. What is the best option to take? And uh, Richard Garfield then started talking about metagame design with obviously magic in 95 or 96. And in 2000, he gave a, a, a conversational, uh, not a conversation, a, uh, a uh, thing at the game design conference. A, a panel about metagame. So, you know, it, it comes down to the game within the game. And it's really easy to see that in things like Magic the Gathering, Hearthstone, 
where the players find out what the best cards to play and the decks to play to get over a 50% win rate uh, over time. So, you know, you're shooting for 56, 57% win rates, uh, if not higher. That's kind of the, the classical definition of metagame. Let's we'll throw it over to Ramin, who has another definition. <laughs> okay, I guess that makes it my turn. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, I would consider those early uses of the term to be in the realm of game theory, which is actually a mathematical process, which is not really about games, even though uh, some of us make heavy use of game theory in the design of games. Uh, I, I attempted to start using the term as, as it's now related to used in, in gaming in about 10 years ago because I had to make a um, distinction between gameplay and metagame to explain how uh, purchasing an advantage in a free-to-play game or any game really where you can purchase an advantage uh, is, is functionally uh, is okay to players in the metagame, but not okay in the gameplay. So I, I at the time, I defined uh, metagame as the gameplay that occurs between gameplay sessions, if that makes sense. And typically, when I, uh, especially in games as a service, uh, a gameplay session would be you competing directly in real time against other players. So the metagame would be stuff that you would be doing on on your own between gameplay sessions perhaps to prepare for your next gameplay session mm-hmm. and I, I i make use of game economics and neuroscience and uh, a bunch of psychology in order to figure out how uh to do that and magic the gathering i guess uh, to me if there was a metagame uh that was designed for that game it was really just the 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 gambling mechanics that are built into the cards to encourage players to organically trade between each other, but there wasn't really a marketplace created like we would have today to promote that that sort of trade. You, the gameplay between sessions would be the creation of the decks and the testing the decks. You wouldn't consider that a metagame? I, I just said that if, that if there is a metagame design, that would be the, the part that's the, the metagame. Or match okay. together, but there wasn't a marketplace created or anything like that. It's just basically the gambling mechanics that were created to generate the cards, uh, the packs, so that players could engage in trading on their own organically without any design for that from the developer. All right, and uh, to you, Rob. Um, I was just going to say, I mean, it's kind of on both sides. It's the, um, the way I look at it is kind of a fluid process that players take on to do kind of a min-maxing research, uh, then share that knowledge, and then eventually uh, it becomes some like someone else finds a better, or quote, better uh, combination. Like to, to bring up like Dota or anything like that, people find like whatever the, the optimal uh, build is, and everyone goes towards that until someone finds the other optimal build. And then there's this dance between the developer and the player. Does the developer acknowledge, react, suppress what that metagame turns out to be in favor of their own design op- like uh, feelings and, and uh, strategies? Or do they kind of allow the players to, to push that and, and deal with it themselves? But there's always this kind of two-part back and forth because once the metagame kind of identifies and locks onto something that kind of breaks things, so the knowledge of that metagame like, takes over people who might not be interested, then you've got to have that back and forth. But that's kind of the way I see it, is the players kind of define it, the developer kind of rolls with it and, and reacts to it. But that's, that's how I've seen it for a while. Yeah, and... I think for me, I'm definitely, I think, leaning towards uh, what Ramin was saying about kind of like the game outside of the game. And it is something that when I was looking through or doing a lot of the games I was playing for my mobile book, I was watching, like, there's all kinds of fan theories and gameplay breakdowns and 
you know, who's the best character? Who's the best card here? What's the best thing to use? What's your favorite PvP team? And so on. And I think to Rob's point, it's always... I think what's very fascinating is when we get that clash between the developer side and the player side. Because as we've seen, like, the metagame is oftentimes established... Like, even though the game is obviously created by a designer, the meta is oftentimes defined by the consumer. The player. If, you know, pick, again, like with Hearthstone, the era of Miracle Rogue, um, when I was playing Marvel Strike Force, like, heavy PvP, defender-based builds, stuff like that. And the problem, though, is what happens when that meta becomes solidified? What happens when everyone agrees, yes, this one card or this one group that's the best. It would. How do you respond to that as a developer? Because we've seen this kind of go both ways. We've seen some developers who they will break their meta just like, you know, dropping a bomb on their game every five to six months. Um, Dead by Daylight, at the time of us doing the stream, they just had their six and a half year anniversary. And a big point about that anniversary was just saying, hey, we're just going to alter every meta park in the entire game over the last six and a half years, you know, go back and relearn it. And then there are some developers, I think this is where we get to kind of the more, I'm not sure we consider the shadier side, but more the economic side, that if you're, you know, you just release a six-star character or a new card in a competitive game, and everyone considers that to be the meta, maybe we won't change that and let people, you know, just keep buying that or keep, you know, rolling on the banner to hope that they get that. And then they can then, you know, show off and lure over all their friends and rivals. I'd like to counter that with mm -hmm. uh, um, the meta really only applies to those playing at high levels. Now, it exists at lower levels, of course, mm -hmm. but the people at the high levels are the, are, are the only ones that have to follow the meta and when the meta gets stale people people stop playing so in, at least in card games i don't know about gotchas and and that and and free-to-play mobiles but in the card game arena you have to keep a fresh meta or people burn out or you know in in magic you know tafari was one of the genre defining or uh game defining cards for a while, a couple of years back, and they had to, to nerf it. And really, you know, to change the meta, you either downgrade a character, you nerf it, or you upgrade other things, you buff them. And that is something where the company is reacting to what the players have found, because I don't think in the time frames that we're talking about, the game developers can test for these metas and design around it. it. It doesn't make sense to me. Now, Raman, you mentioned that uh, in World of Tanks, that was predefined? Uh, I can't take uh, um, credit for the designer World of Tanks. I, I, I wrote about the designer World of Tanks and then was added to the team uh, post-launch, where I did some optimizations, but... Uh, did not design World of Tanks. I designed World of Tanks Blitz. Oh, okay. I don't know what Blitz is. The mobile version. Mm -hmm. So they analyzed all the all the tanks against all the other tanks, and when they released an update, they knew what was going to become the dominant tank and the dominant strategies. Well, if we were attempting to create an imbalance, then then yes, but I uh, that wasn't the objective while I was at the company. Um, okay. I've already had a podcast with with Josh about how that may have become the the objective later on after I left. We should mm -hmm. post that in the comments. <laughs> Not in the comments in the about or the you know the thing below. I mean, because in pay to win, which mm -hmm. we were we were we were very clear that uh, the part of the company culture and war gaming while I was there, uh, this is straight from the founders. Pay to win was not an option. I was. It was made very clear to me during my hiring interview that, that they were vehemently against this, which is, was fantastic for me because I was also, um, which is part of why I was hired. Uh, um, but that, that, that they did a 180 later on after 
uh, I left and they started bringing in uh, people from Machine Zone who are very much into uh, pay to win. Uh, and so then you started seeing uh, premium tanks entering the ecosystem that were clearly superior uh, to other tanks, um, uh, especially regarding to like their hitboxes and stuff. If you understand what I'm meaning mm-hmm. there. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, and, and that's just like, uh, for instance, um, that makes me think of uh, Blizzard and Activision, where they, uh, it, one of the critical things about making sure gameplay is fair is the matchmaker. And, uh, and they were so proud of their efforts to make mismatch makers uh, that mm-hmm. they even went to the extreme length of patenting it sometime after I detected they were working on this. Um, which blows my mind still to this day that they would not only publicly uh, acknowledge that they make mismatch makers, but that they would also patent mm-hmm. them so that everyone would know. Yeah, and I, I wrote about that in the last book. I think I posted the uh, link to the patent on our little Discord chat as well. I think, I guess technically Microsoft now owns that, if since Microsoft bought Activision Blizzard. But yeah... Definitely a just a very wild situation there, and I think to Ramin's point, I think that's another very important aspect when we talk about meta design, is that there's a difference between designing, let's say, six really good options or how many you want in any kind of game, versus actually explicitly tweaking something to kind of force that meta. And to give you guys an example of this, I always go back to Marvel Strike Force in this regard. That they introduce a character that, at the time, they were the only one who could revive somebody on your team if one of your teammates died. So if you build a very powerful team that's, you know, all synergy base, and let's say your opponent manages to kill one of them, well, I can just bring him right back, all those synergy bonuses come back. There was no defense against it, there was no way to get around that. Until they add in another legendary character, it was like a year, year and a half afterwards, and that was a character that only someone who had, you know, a lot of paid currency or, you know, super high level could actually manage. So for a good, like, year or so of the game being out, this one character dominated the meta, and, you know, people complained about it, and there was never a free alternative put into it. And I think this kind of goes similar to Ramin's example of, you know, tweaking, you know, the hitbox on a tank to make sure that, right. hey, this tank, yes, it's like, well, your other tanks, but this one has a little smaller window where you can actually do, you know, max damage to it. And I think one thing that we've been kind of talking about is that the player base is shockingly good at identifying meta components in a game. They will break your game every which way to find that advantage, even if your game is not competitively driven. We've seen, you know, how many videos on single player games. I remember seeing dozens of videos on Neo and Dark Souls or any Souls like. You know, this is how you build a perfect spec weapon, you can beat the entire game on the Soul Level 1. And when they find something that is unethical when they spot those issues they will raise every red flag they will you know sound the air horn siren to people to let them know about it well that's i, I would posit that i'm sorry go ahead i was uh, just uh, gonna bring in the youtube thing i mean that's that kind of drove it even faster because everyone's mm-hmm. wanting to get that special knowledge out there to get those clicks and views <laughs> So it just mm-hmm. drives itself. It's the meta, meta, meta thing. It's crazy. I... <laughs> okay, go ahead. I would say that we've been writing articles of you know people are writing up stuff about gameplay for a long time. But I would suggest that um, our public consciousness of meta game design has only been fairly recently, uh, and um, and especially with influencers on YouTube, I've really been impressed by how much their understanding of what goes on behind the game has has uh, has increased just in the last say five years and that's really trickled down to the players as they watch these youtube videos and they become conscious of what 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 the other game is that the developers are playing with them 
Yep, and that, I think, is that when we talk about specifically from like a live service or free-to-play game, that's always, I think, in the back of the minds of people who play it. Am I actually winning, you know, because of my skill, or am I winning because, you know, the game just decided to lower the stats of this enemy, or, you know, I somehow got that very lucky character? Um, as I just did a video about the game Marvel Contest of Champions, I talked about how the, in that game's meta, you know, there is a huge difference in terms of account quality, getting a, you know, bad, good, fantastic character. And it's always that issue of, as a developer, how do you balance your game around this? And I guess this is, a, I guess it would be a good question for the group then. In when we talk about things from a game design standpoint, you obviously as a developer know, okay, you know, we're going to introduce these enemies, or we're going to have a challenge, let's say, all about bleed damage, or ice damage, or whatever. How do you tweak a game, or how do you balance your game to make sure that you're not creating that, I guess, untrusting or that very manipulative meta? Of say, oh, we're only going to design this so that if only people who have, you know, these three specific six star characters, they're going to be the only ones who can do this. Everyone else, you know, good luck, you know, fight out in the weeds. I think when you create an environment like that, people are going to try to break it. They probably will uh, because they can, you know, you get 10,000 players uh, really hammering at something or 100,000 players in some of these games can fall. They're going to they're gonna find the exploit in it. Before, you know, computer games, metagaming used to be min-maxing in, say, role-playing games. And that, you know, spread very slowly because we didn't have the internet and kind of spread between groups. And nothing was done about it unless there was a big addition change. Because you couldn't, you couldn't send downloads, you couldn't send updates. To, to everybody, so you would have to wait for, you know, 4th edition or 5th edition. Um, so now, you know, they can just patch the meta so that when it's broken and when someone finds it, um, you know, they fix it. I'm not 100% sure how much testing is done ahead of time because it gets exponentially harder the more characters there are, the more permutations there are, the more uh, items there are. Unless they just, you know, code hard stops if you don't have X, Y, and Z, you're not getting through. Like some visual novels do uh, with, with uh, stat tracks. I would, I would, uh, uh, I'm thinking about how... Uh, Back in 2000, when I wrote that first article about um, trading between players, it was happening organically. It was, there wasn't any thought out on the part of developers about this, so they weren't designing for this or this this metagame that had started uh, appearing, which was the the player trades. Um, and in fact, I believe it was in 2004 that Blizzard uh, banned that type of or organic trading. Um, in their end user license agreement and the rest of the industry followed suit after that. Now, now there's, there's attempts to, especially with web three, uh, to reverse that and encourage, uh, uh, that sort of trading. So you're seeing an intense amount of activity around these sort of, uh, metagame elements that are, that are related to player to player trades and, uh, how to create that securely. But, you could even argue that there's a metagame existing between the players and the developers, and that's what that's what makes it interactive media, um, where where the you know the developer is trying to manipulate the player's behavior, uh, while the, the 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 influencers are trying to teach the players how to identify this manipulation and how to avoid it, and so there's this this game of cat and mouse where. Uh, the developers are trying to beat the players, um, which I, I, you know, I've, I've written. I consider that unethical, but it, but it, it's 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 pretty much a norm. I mean, especially when you look at something like uh, um, Diablo Mortal, where um, you know I argue that increasingly games would metagame would become so important in games that it would be actually be most of the design of a game. And in, in the case of Diablo Mortal, I'd say they put a lot more work in 
to this cat and mouse game uh, that they're trying to hide, even though uh, compared to the amount of work they actually put into the gameplay mm-hmm. of of the game, uh, which is uh, you know, which is why a lot of influencers don't even talk about the game anymore because they consider it so unethical. Yeah, I mm-hmm. feel like a, a good way to approach what you say in terms of the the ethical dilemma you face in reacting to a meta going and trying to force one yourself might be to take this kind of like, I want to win, I want to beat the players, players want to beat me, into more of a fl- friendly banter. Like, okay, well, you got us, you, you've shown us where the game is broken, we're going to try and, you know, change things a little bit, make keep things interesting, as opposed to, well, we're going to make sure that these people pay to win, um, and then we can't we can't nerf them because they paid us, <laughs> and we can't get anyone else equal to them because these guys paid us. And then you, you do you have that problem just inherent uh, in that transaction. Uh, but yeah, I feel like the goal should be to embrace the players, embrace the communities, and really bring them into the development process, which I feel like happens uh, the, naturally in, in many circumstances. But yeah, you're right; it can be it can turn bad fast. Yeah, and like with the Moral Strike Force example, instead of nerfing the character or anything like that, all the developer did was make her drop rate super low. Like, there were like never any banners for that character. You had to either had bought that character like week one of it being released, or you may get it, you know, by pure happenstance, maybe like a year of lucky random drops. And again, like, it's that issue of. Our, you know, our paying players, you know, we nerf this and they're going to revolt. You know, the whales aren't going to want you to nerf their favorite character. But the character or the build or whatever just completely demolishes everything else in the game. And it's a very, you know, this is where we get to like some more of the unethical designs of some of these games. When kind of the monetization of the game or getting money from the game is kind of put ahead of actually maintaining the stability and long-term play of it. What about um, when we're not talking about games as a service or PvP-style games, the metagame developing in, say, Slay the Spire or even an RPG like Baldur's mm-hmm. Gate? Um, you know, obviously there are optimal character uh, builds in, in various games. There are, there are optimal... Uh, ways to play various uh, deck builders. You know, the cards to always go for, the, the relics to always go for, the builds to, to take to, to get to the overpowered state or break it. The new <laughs> horde games, Vampire Survivors, I guess that's what they're being called now as the, <laughs> the horde games. Obviously, yeah. there's... Horde you know, Light or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it's a good genre. Yeah. <laughs> It's a great genre, uh, but you know, you know, it it plays on on trying to break it. Where the meta for that game is to break it. So, how do you design, say, a word game with overpowered abilities, but yet still make it fun to the player? Or does it not matter? You're just, you know, you're just going for those. Uh, 10,000 uh, dopamine hits. Well, I mean, I, I would suggest that the, whatever people are doing to try to figure out how to win in the gameplay uh, is, uh, you can describe that as meta, but I would say that that's actually not like meta game design. That's just players trying to figure out how to improve their gameplay, but that's not actually anything that's designed by the developer. And I think this gets to a, a comment by uh, Bows Moon uh, from earlier about could this explain a large disenfranchisement with the current era of games that meta mindset has trickled down to casual players and made them perhaps less engaged in the world and more engaged in game design interactions. And I think uh, to what Seth was just talking about with regard to a game like Slay the Spire or to any kind of like single player game where the kind of design is, I guess, solved in the sense that, like, in a game like Slay Spire, we're not going to be seeing 30 new cards come every, you know, every cycle. We're not going to be seeing new characters come at a regular basis. 
it is a game that's more about, okay, how do I solve this equation of, you know, getting enough damage to beat the boss? And mm -hmm. when we see kind of like the meta or the analysis develop around that, this is something that I've said before, that I typically don't like min-maxing in games. I feel that kind of robs it of the interesting elements of playing it. I've said this like for a lot of like in our roguelike talks. I always like the Island of Misfit Toys approach. How do I take this random card and this random artifact and this, this, and this, and somehow I break the game that way? That I rather kind of letting it occur organically versus say like when we talk about, you know, the traditional idea of a meta game that I'm already building my strategy before I play the game. And thereby, you know, it, it kind of like robs me of the actual play of the game, you know, at the actual time. That makes sense. Well, I, I'm resisting this 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 creep into uh, what the players think about, you know, mm -hmm. how to win uh, as meta game design. But it is, I guess, you can consider meta game. And uh, I gave a talk in 2016 about the in, in St. Petersburg about the current state of mobile game development. And, and during that talk, I get this very long explanation where I explained that, that Tinder was the top mobile game at the time. And, and uh, uh, I could perhaps argue that it's still the top mobile game uh, out there. Um, and, and if you want to talk about min-maxing, wow, Tinder has <laughs> a lot of min-maxing. And you've got just, you know, entire... Uh, you know, channels uh, and tons of content on, for instance, YouTube, where people are explaining to you how to min-max that game so that you can beat your opponent. Uh, then they almost use those exact type of words, too, which is just uh, kind of mind-blowing, even though they, they probably wouldn't really think of it as a game. And, and my audience at the time was like, wait, wait, I thought we were talking about games. Why are you talking about Tinder? But uh, Tinder is, to me, is absolutely a game. With a lot of really that. high value user generated content. <laughs> if you go for that con, uh, um, that that theory, then then life itself is is you can metagame life. I figured you'd be going in that direction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, how do I how would I counter that? It's it's difficult because it gets murkier and murkier the further you go. Yeah, that's tough. That's that's a little bit. Uh, that's getting a little bit too high high level meta for me. But I I get the point. I mean, I feel like YouTube is that same way. You know, um, like we're all like on YouTube, we're all trying to get get people to come find us and leveraging the algorithm as best we can. For those of us who are even aware of it, I I have no clues, uh, and I don't know anyone uh, who really has a good grasp. But um, yeah, <laughs> life as meta game, I feel like is a real easy way to just go insane trying to grapple with it it's uh, <laughs> a lot there mm -hmm. yeah what route do i go down <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, yeah uh, go, ahead. go ahead oh no go ahead finish I mean, it, there's i mean there's increasingly more and more strings above us as we go through life uh, especially as ai is being developed that <clears throat> We're not even supposed to be conscious of, which is, uh, you know, you could get into conspiracy theories, but, you know, there's so much science related to it that uh, uh, it's not a conspiracy. It's just uh, really high technology. And most people aren't aware of it and probably would rather not be aware of it. Hmm. I What's guess an here? example of that. The, the Matrix was a good example of that. Okay. And I feel like we're rocketing towards the Matrix. <laughs> Especially when you, if you took a look at what type of AI is in the pipeline. I guess, like, like to continue that train of thought for a second, when we talk about the use of, like, gamification in either, like, everyday lives or incentivizing people to do something, would this be considered, like, an example of that kind of, like, metagame design? Well, um, I can use an example from the game I'm designing right now, which is, uh, uh, um, I have, it's Star Garden, and we have this this pre-game, which we call a mini-game, that occurs before it, and we're about to do uh, an Arama Mint. Uh, Aramas are these cute little creatures from our world. Um, and uh, to me, uh, just putting out a PFP 
which is what most people think of when they think of an NFT, um, is not really, it doesn't really have a metagame attached to it. So to me, I would think that the, the lifespan of that content would be uh, as short as you would expect a game that doesn't have a, a metagame. Metagame is great for extending content by giving purpose to the content uh, or, or long-term goals in playing with that content. So uh, I'm in, I've, I've just finished doing this um, metagame design for how to gamify uh, our Aramas, which are actually customizable by our players as opposed to what you would normally think of as a PFP where you just have it and it's always that one thing. And really only when you have the NFT, it's really just a link to that thing that isn't even, isn't even, you know, in your hands. Um, but, but, but since we can modify these uh, uh, NFTs, we can have the players can modify them themselves and change the, the Arama uh, by changing its appearance as they wish by creating certain sets of clothing, like you would see, for instance, you know, in the original Diablo I had, you know, equipment sets, then you can activate special abilities, um, which, you know, again, that goes all the way back to Diablo or, or earlier. Um, that, to me, makes it more interesting because now players will be trying to find certain pieces for a reason. They'll be trading with other people to try to complete their sets, and I think that'll make the... the um, the whole Rama, you know, uh, metagame will drive much more engagement with our Ramas than if we just re released a bunch of PFPs. Let's see what's going on in chat. Yeah, and I think, like, again, like, the player interaction is such a key factor in this. And... To bring this back to like the question about like metagame design, I, I like someone to throw this over to you, Ramin, for a second. Like with your game and with the games you've worked on, how do you, I guess, like balance these two different factors of I want to design content that is obviously popular and profitable, but at the same time, I don't want to make something that is just literally somebody buys this, it's an I win button. Or it's, you know, this will guarantee you top 10 spot on the server in terms of that content. Well, I mean, uh, uh, you must know I'm burning to answer a question like that. I just didn't <laughs> really want to, 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 to be the one to divert in that direction. But, I mean, for me, as a developer, I, I'd like to think that I'm ahead of the competition in the area of metagame design, uh, which... If, if I wasn't an ethical person, would be really bad news for my players. Uh, because right now, a lot of the metagame design you see that's out there is, is ways the developers are trying to trick or manipulate um, uh, players for, their, for the developer's best interest. Uh, I think the, the best use of this technology, um, like pretty much anything technology, is to serve the consumer not the maker of the technology. So in everything I build, I, I don't put it in there unless it's something that improves the gameplay for the player and meets their needs, uh, which means they're basically, uh, I'm introducing a new business model called Free-to-Play Plus, which is takes all the advantages of Free-to-Play. I'm about to publish an article on this. Um, uh, but it removes the microtransactions, which is what really wrecks uh, the free-to-play model. I mean, so going all the way back to MapleStory in 2001, where the microtransactions were used to generate revenue in a free-to-play environment, uh, and were also used to break that game to make it uh, uh, pay-to-win. So you remove that those microtransactions and you remove the pay-to-win, then you get you get I think the most utopian business model that I can come up with in the current environment. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I guess with like some of the examples, as we talked about, I think one of our first uh, podcasts together was trying to define like what is considered pay to win. So I guess like to kind of like add on to that point then, so for one of the games that you're designing right now, that obviously, you know, anything in the A breaking you'll need to say, but like what would you consider to be, I guess, 
an ethical example of a microtransaction in this regard versus one that would be considered unethical. I mean, this is, this goes back to 10 years to where I was trying to actually define this stuff because I was trying to figure out, well, what is ethical? What isn't ethical? Uh, where is it okay to, to buy advantage and where isn't it okay to buy, buy advantage? And for me, for it's okay to for a player to buy advantage in the metagame as long as that doesn't translate to advantage in gameplay. Now, you could say, well, if a player is getting advantage in the metagame, then maybe that means they're progressing through the game faster than someone else. Now, uh, in order to prevent that from becoming pay-to-win, like it would maybe in an open-world game, um, where people could just compete freely without any sort of matchmaker, uh, the, the key thing is to have a matchmaker that protects players from abuse from players who are at a different uh, advancement level in the game. Uh, just like you would have an ELO system in chess to, you know, to make sure that players are properly matched, which is, again, why, why I, I still to this day are really shocked about what Blizzard did with their mismatch uh, maker patent. Um, but but the I, I had to go a step further. Uh, uh, for instance, in in World of Tanks or World of Warships, uh, those games use a matchmaker to a, what I would call a symmetrical matchmaker to protect players to make sure matches are are, are fair enough. If you ignore the, the hitbox locations on the premium tanks and ships and stuff, um, uh, to take that a step further to allow players to play against their neighbors, which is uh, what we're going to be doing with geolocation. We're trying to create a very uh, social environment that, uh, unlike anything that, except for maybe Pokemon Go, which just happened accidentally. We're trying to create a very social environment where people can play against their neighbors and be on different teams. But a normal symmetrical matchmaker would would die under those conditions. It would just be too hard to to match those two teams if they weren't equal enough. So I've I created a an asymmetrical matchmaker, uh, which I started developing while I was at Wargaming, um, uh, which allows two teams of who aren't properly power matched to still play by removing the win loss binary and replacing it with something else. That's that's as much as I can say without <laughs> leaking too much alpha there. Does that make sense? I think so. I think it's only one will. I definitely want to see it like in action, like when the time comes, just to see like how the community uh, plays around with it. Um, let's see. This question from, or this point from the Thousand Earl, I think is a really good question for the group. Uh, they were talking about uh, designers who are trying so hard to design a good meta that might be after the wrong thing. Like the devs who are trying so hard to design an esports friendly game. So I guess for the table here, um, when it comes to the actual, like, when, as a designer, should a designer be actively thinking about the meta as you're creating new content? And I think to Pony, I think it was Pony's example about, uh, like, with League of Legends, that, like, they introduced a new champion... And then the following champion could either be, you know, a direct counter to the previous one or trying to, you know, force the meta into a new direction. This is, again, like going back to the Dead by Daylight example that their whole point about just breaking their meta was just as a way of countering all the established meta strategies, all the established builds that have been built up over the last six and a half years of that game. Like, is it better, I think, from, I guess, like, like, the health of your game to be just constantly, just, like, purposely fighting against the meta? Or is it better just to create, you know, new content and then maybe kind of let the chips fall where they may and then kind of, like, take stock after that? Um, you see I, in these, go ahead. Yeah. What we see in these, in these free-to-play games um, uh, with an eSport, League of Legends, Dota, um, even Magic the Gathering, especially Hearthstone, is the new expansion, the new meta, is always more powerful than the stuff before. So you're getting tremendous amounts of po- uh, power creep because they want people to go off and buy the new champion. Because they're going to be X 
um, much better than, than the other person. And then in the next expansion, they counter that by releasing someone more powerful. It's, it's actually quite, uh, you know, so they're not looking necessarily for a good meta, or they're balancing it against power creep. They're balancing it against getting people to spend money on, on the new character. I, these are companies that aren't trying to balance their games at all. They're tr intentionally trying to unbalance their games to make money that way. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. Oh, uh, I mean, it's, it's not too far from, from your point. Um, it's, you don't have to... I think it's fair for a company to try and, and establish a meta in their original design. Uh, it's very difficult. I think it's fair, though. Um, and even in patches, trying to consider what the existing meta is and maybe change it. Now, for-profit uh, is certainly a driving force, right? Um, but the staleness, uh, I think we had alluded to it a, a while ago, I think Seth mentioned, the staleness of, of any given you know, meta where it gets to a point where, well, everyone's playing the same build, everyone's playing the same deck strategy. That's when the developer should probably step in and say, okay, well, I kind of want to mix it up. I don't want my players to get bored. But that's where that back and forth happens. I feel you must let the players determine the way they want to go and then react accordingly without, you know, that's where the those problems come in, like without being too heavy handed about the new character they have coming out. Although I understand why they'd want to push it. It showcases the freshness of the project, the product. Uh, yeah, the money involved is also, uh, the like I say, the driving factor, too. But it, it is fair for that back and forth to happen. I think that's the most ideal situation is that the developer sees all these players going a certain direction and says, hey, you know what? Um, there's more to this game than just that character. Here's a nudge in a different direction. Um, I, I, I think it can go in that kind of back and forth. I think it has to in a lot of, a lot of cases. But that, that's how I look at it in terms of whether or not the developer can or should push a meta to begin with. When, when developers introduce new content and charge for it, and they've previously put out uh, content that, that either they charged for or players had to work really hard for. Uh, you know, that previous content had some value, either the, you know, the earned value or the, the, the paid value. And when the, um, when the developer puts out new content that's superior, uh, it destroys the value of previous content, which is, I think, uh, very discouraging for players. Uh, just like, uh, I mean, you know, you, when you buy a car, you expect the value to go down over time, but it, but you don't necessarily expect somebody to just, you know, uh, outlaw roads and make your car useless uh, <laughs> you know, after you bought it. Uh, so, um, and and, it, and it, even this happens a lot, even as we go into Web three too, uh, where people are owning their own assets. It's especially important. So, this is something I've had to really put. Um, some recent years thought into is, is how do we introduce new content uh, uh, but without reducing the value of any previous content because uh, if if the whole point of, of, of having these tradable assets in games is to ha is for them to have some sort of value that could be uh, enduring uh, you don't want the developer being your worst enemy by 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 putting out stuff that's going to reduce the value of the things they previously told you would be valuable, um, even though that's like seems like it's occurring in ninety nine percent of the space right now. Mm. Yeah, with magic, the rotations where cards go out of play mm -hmm. um, unless they're reprinted. So every couple of months, you're you're spending um, money on on new boxes. You have to. That's why I caught yeah. magic finally. Yeah, I mean, they, they they were thinking about this stuff way ahead of us because they had to with their physical cards. Uh, um, it's yeah. interesting seeing you know their solutions and our solutions. There's some overlap because we're trying to solve the same problems. Mm -hmm. I, I think it it is definitely a um, a thing to think about in terms of that the the force that you put into it. Yeah, you want to sell something new, but yeah, you're right. You don't want to take the the hundreds if sometimes thousands of hours someone's put into something and just say, Hey, yeah, that that's no longer valid. You can't do anything with that character anymore or that build. Um, but it, I feel like that the discussion between the developer and the player 
should be as lighthearted as possible because yeah, you don't want to become the player's enemy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Certainly that happens. And one way it might say, well, the player will leave. A lot of times they don't, they put a lot of effort into sticking around here. And yeah, when you start forcing them to uh, be, it's, if it's an antagonistic relationship, yeah, it might exist on the line that you still might be getting money out of that person, but you want them to have fun. Like uh, it's, you do, you put a lot of hours into something, you're kind of attached to it. You're at a, in a rock and a hard place at that point. Is grinding really fun? Like taking, <laughs> you know, the MMO? It takes a certain type of personality to like that. But if we look at raids, you know, the designers of, of the good raids were, were trying to figure out how to just absolutely devastate uh, the party and, and make them keep coming back and keep coming back and, and then equipping up until they could finally uh, get there. A lot of that was with, through stat management, but there was also rotations for what to do and where to stand and what mob to, to head first. I feel like that's a puzzle element, introducing that that additional challenge. So if the players do find a meta that works on one boss and then maybe works on a d- bunch of others, the developer can come up with that thing and says, okay, well, there, it's too easy now uh, with this combination of characters. Let's make one that's kind of immune to that. So yeah, your your characters still have meaning. They can they can be powerful in a lot of different ways. But maybe that one boss, um, they're going to have to think differently for. That's, I like that. I think that's a really cool approach. And I think to um, kind of build off what Seth was talking about a few minutes ago regarding power creep, that is, I think, another major issue when we talk about kind of the developer putting their finger on the scale of the meta. If I remember when I was trying to play Hearthstone, it's like, okay, the standard, you know, two-cost car is maybe like a 1-2 attack defense or a 2-2. But then, you know, the new expander introduces a two-cost car that's like a 2-2 and it does extra damage or it heals your party. And it's that case, and I think this goes to what, that's what Ramin was talking about, that you don't want to introduce something that invalidates something else that you've put out into your game. And that inherently becomes more difficult as your game goes, you know, from month to month to year to year. And when, or if you design your game purposely around that, they, we all know that all year one content is going to become obsolete when year two comes out. I think that creates a very unethical situation, a very unethical atmosphere. And it's one of the reasons why I stopped playing a lot of those games, where it's just like, well, either I keep up, or the second I fall behind, I'm never going to catch up unless I spend tons and tons of money, and maybe get that lucky new character. And it's that case of, I think for a lot of these longer-running like mobile games, especially in the gacha market, that you can see the kind of like difference in the mindset of their designs. Um, with a contest of champions, it's like, okay, here's a five-star, you know, magic champion. They just do magic damage. Okay, here's a five-star magic character, you know, designed last year. They they are completely nullify all special effects. They gain free healing. They, you know, they kill enemies like half the speed of anyone else. Why should I ever use that other five-star character or that other mythic character? Well. The answer is no. Like, there's characters in some of these games that they're inherently a bad choice. Like, there's never a reason why you should ever take that character. But they're still in the game. They're still in the monetization pool. And I think, to me, that is definitely a major issue. They're still in the pool for the suckers that bought them before, but the new players are probably becoming astute enough not to buy the old content. Or you get on lucky roll like I do when it comes to some of these contests, <laughs> and you just get all the old meta characters, and you never get anything new. <laughs> Starting to think we should start a, a, a game dev roundtable for contests. I I could certainly rant and rave about <laughs> that one there. <laughs> the the last time I was in a at the Blizzard headquarters for an interview. 
few years ago. Uh, you know, they said they were looking for a game economist, and I got there and I started talking about game econ uh, economics, and they they literally got mad at me and started insulting me because they didn't want to talk about game economics. They wanted to pump me from information on gotcha. Um, and, uh, and I wasn't being cooperative, so uh, I, you know, I didn't get the job. And, uh, um, you know, and I was like, well, don't you guys want to talk about game economics? They got, they got mad at me. The job was, the supposed to was titled game, uh, game economist. So I just assumed they wanted to talk about game economics. The metagame of the interview, trying to figure out what they're really asking for. <laughs> In in um, sports management games, fantasy fantasy management games, um, understanding the meta is almost critical to to being able to to go through. I mean, obviously there are players that are better than others and lineups that are better than others. So you're gonna wanna uh, you're gonna wanna hit those, uh, even if you're even if you're a new player. You know there are, there are tons of resources resources for. Finding out, you know, stuff on, on on there's a whole industry on fantasy football and stuff like that. And like as we were saying earlier, like with the rise of YouTuber and Twitch streamers, there are entire channels and discussions dedicated to not just every single mobile, every single free to play game, but every single strategy like some of the more popular like mobile streamers and youtubers they'll have like 10 15 different channels you know this channel is dedicated to this live service game this channel is dedicated to this one and there is that whole and to i think to rob's point earlier like there is an economy around who can be the first one to break this game who can be the first one to make that video saying Hey, I figure out how to do this challenge with a with this five star, even just like with all three star characters. It's completely free, and you know you do this, it will guarantee you top ranking on the server. I remember doing that with game previews and 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 game articles in the early MMOs back twenty years ago. Yeah, uh, you know I would I, I, you know I I always I had this. Uh, this promise when I did a, a game preview uh, for an MMO because I only did MMOs uh, that I would not do a preview unless I had spent 200 hours in the game and after 200 hours I'd know all, uh, a lot of tricks and so I would publish a, a bunch of these tricks and I think that, that made my articles popular but it's really just the same thing you see now in, in YouTube uh, you know if, you, if, it, if, a, if an influencer is playing a game uh, enough to become an expert at the game, then then they'll be trying to teach their their followers how to get a, get that expertise, and that makes the their their information useful to the people watching those those videos, and so they get uh, they become more popular. Yeah, that's I mean, it's not new, but yeah, it's the the race to the information, and with YouTube now, you can find one trick, and then make a video about that one trick, yeah. and then. Hope someone doesn't take it and leverage it for their more popular channel. Oh yeah, well, there's. Is... <laughs> Go ahead. Go oh, ahead. there's like controversies around that with people saying, "Oh, you stole my strategy." No, no, I came up with it first. No, you just stole. You ripped it off from me. <laughs> and there's a good example of this. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Seth. <laughs> well, in a lot of cases, the the really popular streamers, the really big streamers. That are streaming some of these these gotcha games or mobile uh, games as a service. They're being paid to to do that, and they're given accounts with with everything unlocked and and that type of thing. So so it's easier for them, but it generates money for um for the 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 games because people go, oh okay, I can I can I can beat this. I can get past it. You know, I I can accelerate my 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 growth curve. This has become a real problem with Web3 and, and blockchain games where you have uh, influencers <laughs> who are uh, uh, hyping the, the hell out of a, out of a, uh, um, of a new blockchain game uh, and, and giving basically explicit financial advice saying, you know, you should buy these. They're going to go up in value, you know, you know, you can, you're, you're, get it while it's hot, you know, and, and, and they just, they, they, you know, it, 
it, it's like it's like being in a multi-level marketing you know seminar where yeah. they're trying to get you to to buy the stuff because then you can sell it to other people for more than you bought it for and it's like easy money and 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 and, and they're just paid to do that and uh and the people you know believe this and 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 believe that it's like an impartial influencer they don't realize that you know they don't every time i see this i look to see the disclaimer to say how much they've been paid and they don't they don't they don't share that so i i don't even know if that's legal it probably isn't but there's so much uh wild wild west stuff going on right now in web3 a lot of it is pump and dumps with those influencers and i think that's you know something that's hurting the development of web point uh web three uh dramatically i mean the the projects are often pump and dumps but my concern is specifically the the unethical behavior of the influencer that that's a paid um you know advertiser but isn't isn't disclosing that which right. i know I, I i that became a big deal I remember that was a big deal in in regular MMOs back in I don't know was that 2004 2005 with Shadowbane where uh, uh, Ubisoft was handling their their publishing and and their marketing and uh, Ubisoft hired a person at one of our competing websites back when I was a journalist uh, to that had exclusive access to the alpha and was putting out articles typing. Uh, Shadowbane, and right. uh, we found out that that guy, that person, was actually an employee of Ubisoft and was being paid under the table uh, to do that. And we published that, and that created a, a huge civil war in the game journalism uh, environment because you know that you know it was perceived as two competing news sources going after each other. But uh, I think later on that ended up becoming illegal in the United States. Uh, um, it's still going on in other parts of the world. You have uh, to declare that you're getting paid, yeah, but no one does. But but, it, but that's the thing. It's it's even if it's illegal, it's not. It's still yeah, happening, and it's not. It's not. Um, doesn't seem to be. It, it, they don't seem to be enforcing it. I, I report it to to YouTube when I see it, but I don't know if they do anything about it either. They don't. <laughs> you know, a lot of the uh, gambling people uh, that uh, stream or. or do video on on slot machines they're getting paid uh, they're getting you know in some cases millions of dollars to to play and uh they're not playing with their own money um all so, those uh, oh good go ahead i was gonna say all the csgo scandals with the uh skin with the uh, crates, yeah. yeah and you know gaming is not the only industry this is happening in in almost every marketing situation you know, people not declaring affiliate links, people trying to hide affiliate links. It's illegal. Uh, people not declaring that they, they are paid to uh, review a product. That's illegal. Um, hyping a product for money in any, any financial gain uh, by the people that, that design it is illegal. And you see it in productivity. You see it in pretty much every, every get-rich-quick scheme. Um, who's that guy on YouTube that... Uh, has the 15 cards and all he reads all the books um you know he's he's hyping a product and uh um he's he's not declaring that he's hyping the product he's trying to uh uh, uh, uh he's trying to hide it as this is what you know did made me a millionaire yeah no <laughs> yeah that goes well, way back getting... into the days of payola um for exactly DJs and, yeah well, I don't know, what is about... it illegal? I don't know, but it should be. Uh, yeah, I interrupted Remy, and I'm sorry. No, 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 no worries. Uh, what about as we move towards uh, more and more complex forms of AI? You already have systems where, uh, 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 you know, a human can just you know, create a thousand influencers with a few kits of a, of a keyboard to counter any bad publicity that they they may be getting and uh you know humans use uh often relying on inductive inductive reasoning where they you know if they see something if they see the you know when they're driving if they see the the light is green and they think oh it's safe because the last thousand times i've driven through the green light nothing bad happened they just assume that at some point through inductive reasoning because this is the repeating behavior that it that it must be okay to cross the light if it's green without looking 
um, well, the same thing here. You know, you just you're tricking the brain's reliance on inductive reasoning by spamming them with a thousand influences that they assume are real people, but they're just AI. And 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 the few people who are real get drowned out, and you ignore those because you go with what whatever has the most positive sources, just like on our review. That's our reviews work. You know, you you look and see how many five star reviews and how many one star reviews. But if all the five stars are bots, it 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 um, undermines your ability to use inductive reasoning to to make a decision, and uh, and and it's basically, I mean, it's a, it's a way of controlling behavior. Um, and I mean, when we look at kind of like the early twenty tens of the mobile industry, how many just shady and un unethical games were released, and they drown out all the games that are trying to be legitimate, and it is that very, I mean, that. You know, well has been poisoned so effectively that there are so many people these days who they will not look at anything mobile, anything mm -hmm. that is free to play, because you know how many stories that they've heard of someone being burned by a game, or you know, someone spending tens of thousands of dollars by accident, and consumer trust is such a major point. I, I think that may could be a little bit too much of a tangent, but it is such a factor as we talk about when it comes to consumers understanding the meta or the game outside the game. That they hear that, yeah, this game is good, but if you don't get this, this, and this, or if you don't spend $5,000 to get these great characters, you might as well just not play. They're not going to play that. They're not even going to even think about installing that. I think, you know, that goes even back to, to Facebook gaming. They were trying to do every exploit possible, you know, taking clues from the casino industry. Um, and by exploit, I mean exploiting the player. The, you know, the games weren't fair at all. I don't really think most of the gotchas I play are fair. Um, you know, I think they're all rigged. <laughs> and because there's no regulating body to this, why wouldn't you rig it? I mean, what's to stop you from doing it? No regulating body. Although the EU is starting to uh, clamp down on what they're calling dark patterns, which are things like, you know, uh, making it difficult to cancel a, a subscription. Or, you know, the continue button is where the, the cancel button, or the continue button is, is where the, uh, uh, the OK button should be. You know, just little tricks to, to get you to, to keep involved. I tried to cancel an Amazon Prime subscription. Um, and I know this is off topic, but... Um, I you go away. <laughs> I'm going anyway. Uh, and, you know, it was really difficult. It was much more difficult than doing it in the United States. Go figure. Well, I, 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 when, I, when I went to Panama to, to um, address the... Uh, International Consumer Protection Enforcement Network. Uh, that's, a lot, that's a mouthful. Um, that when they were trying to generate the first uh, first generation of of uh, regulations protecting children and online games, I gave a I risked slash torpedoed my career to give a, a presentation and explain to them all the the tricks that were that the developers were currently using, and I and I and I put up a I gave I did a bunch of slides of showing a a Disney game with the vice president of Disney uh, sitting right next to me, um, who later had to flee the conference after my presentation. Uh, but uh, where uh, the game was uh, Marvel Superhero Squad Online, that was supposedly a game aimed at six to eight year olds, um, and. Uh, I showed like 20 screenshots of the tw first 20 screens that you would see as a child in the tutorial. And every single one had a green button and a red button. And in each case, the, the green button would cause mom's credit card to be charged. And the red button would, would not cause uh, mom's credit card to be charged. And at that age, uh, children know that, again, in Dr. Reasoning, green is good, is safe. Red is bad. Uh, so even if they can't even understand the button or what they're, what the button means, they just keep hitting the green button and they would just charge up mom's credit card. And uh, 
uh, you know, I, I, I intentionally showed every screen so that I could show that it was done on every screen so that it, it wouldn't be, they couldn't argue, the, the vice president next to me couldn't argue, oh, uh, that was just coincidence. Because, you know, mathematically, you do the math, it's just, uh, you know, millions to one chance that that, that, that could be a coincidence. <laughs> and I still remember uh, when someone was arguing about, like, esports should, or I'm sorry, um, uh, mobile games like Clash of Clans should be treated as a regular esports. Look at this tournament. No one spent one cent to get in there. And I asked the person, so how much do they spend lifetime to get to that point? No response. They did not say anything about that. <laughs> oh, uh, I also showed them the adult version because a gazillion made that game and also made like Marvel Online or something like that, and which was actually a very popular game. And uh, the the adult version had none of these gimmicks because adults would see through them. So, uh, so you know, the Disney VP got stood up and said, "Well, you know, we go out of great lengths to protect." Uh, you know, children more than we would adults because they're, you know, and, and, you know, I completely proved that she was lying and that's why she had to to flee the conference uh, right in front of all these regulators. It was probably quite embarrassing for them and probably quite disastrous for my career. Um, but of course, you know, I do it again. I'm, I'm dumb like that. <laughs> um, Some have stronger ethics on the good side. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Um, I, I'm playing a long game here. <laughs> a long game club right here. <laughs> um, as a bit of a time check, we are about an hour and ten of the recording. It is about 6.30 ET my time. Uh, Romain, you said you have to get going by 7, right? Like in about 30 minutes or less? Yes, yeah, that's correct. Okay. Yes, I, I would say maybe another 10 to 15 minutes, I think, at most. Uh, for chat, if you do have any questions about metagame design, meta gameplay, anything like that, this will be officially last call for it. So I guess um I the point that I was thinking about was more about designing a game to be fair. With regards, as we were saying earlier, that to avoid power creep in terms of designing a game or designing more interesting options as opposed to just flat out power. But um, I'm going to throw it over to you guys. Does anyone have any t other topics regarding meta gameplay or meta game design they would like to bring up to the group? We've had a lot of stuff I was uh, uh, looking to cover. So, <laughs> editor talks about uh, what is a game that has the best meta design. Hmm. I'll, I'll recuse myself from answering that question. <laughs> That's tough, right? Um, it's considered a good meta design. I, I mean, in, incidental or purposeful? I know, I think it was a thousand who brought up like the original StarCraft and how there's still a meta every few months around that, even though there hasn't been any new updates. And I think with something like that kind of design, I think that's more like the consumer is kind of dictating that it's more than the developer at that point. If everyone decides one day, hey, I want to play, uh, was it like Dark Templar as my Protoss, then that's going to dictate, well, what's the counter to that? And I don't know that because I'm horrible at StarCraft and I don't play it anymore. But I feel like that's when we get to like something more like, yeah, I guess it's more organic meta at that point. I, my goal is often to uh, create a meta design where with a limited amount of content and without the need for any expansions, uh, people will continue to, to play and continue to pay for the game for years afterwards. So like, for instance, uh, World of Warships is still making a lot of money. There hasn't been any significant uh, expansion to the game other than some new ships. Um, and seven years later, it's still, you know, uh, generating all that money from the original design that that I spent 14 weeks on back in 2014. Our that's, 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 efficient. that's efficient as far as, you know, was it? I was going to say that StarCraft is a 20-year-old game. 
you figure by now people would know every possible combination of strategy that they they can pick. So, you know, it's it's a major accomplishment if the meta is still changing in StarCraft. If if they were if they were generating revenue from StarCraft and in, in substantial amounts uh, today, that would be awesome. But since they aren't, it's just really, uh, and it's not even really a, a a game that was designed with the meta. So it, it's just a, it's like saying how many people play Monopoly today. I, I used to play Monopoly every day after school with my friends. But the if there was a meta, it was us talking over the board, uh, you know, taunting each other or whatever, uh, you know, while we were playing a game that itself didn't have a meta. If you start looking into World Championship Monopoly. It gets really interesting. There are indeed some. So there are indeed some meta behind it, and it just like people. People will min max everything. Well, Monopoly is interesting. It's it's one of those games that uh, a lot of families and and uh, people around the world have house rules, and in that regard, that's kind of a meta. Like the the free putting cash on the free parking space. Not in the game rules whatsoever, but a lot of people play with it for some reason. It's yeah. uh, that's it's an odd um, happenstance. I don't, I don't know where that comes from. If you play vanilla Monopoly, it's a much better game than yeah. actually making those rules. <laughs> um, it's you know people are like, oh, Monopoly is boring. Monopoly takes too long. No, it's a it's a thirty to forty minute game. If <laughs> you're not putting money on free parking or doing any of that weird stuff, and selling every single uh, property that's landed yeah. on. Yeah. I, I would say that if you're able to min max your Monopoly avatar between gameplay sessions, that's medicating. If you're just trying to min max your performance in a game, I would not describe that as meta. I would describe that as strategy or tactics. Uh, whatever you you prefer. Um, now, if you were to create house rules where you're changing the gameplay because of the of the the house rules, then I would say that might be some sort of meta game created by the players. Especially if they have to like flip to see who which rules they're going to play, then you're almost playing like a little game before the game to see what game you're going to be playing. Let's see. Ooh. Okay, there. My mic was acting a little up there. Um, yeah, I've, like I said, I've never finished a Monopoly game myself in my family. We've never managed to get through all that. <laughs> Pony says, I know the I've ever started one. <laughs> yeah, I think the official end to a Monopoly game is when the table gets flipped. Flipped, yeah. <laughs> Someone walks away because I got a bad deal or I got screwed. <laughs> I, I fear that this this you know this term word meta is going to become used to is going to have so many different meetings it down does. the road that, that that it's going to become a useless word, um, and and that's that's sad because I, I put a lot of work into that word. So um, you know, but uh, it's just like you know I'm creating new business models, but new names to the new business models because like. Play to earn, which is was my thing going back to 2000, is now so misused uh, that I don't even want to use the the term play to earn anymore because it has such a negative connotation. Same thing with free to play. Yep, I mean when we were coming up with this topic, like there was a whole idea of the term metagame being used to describe you know the persistence systems in like roguelike and roguelike design, and I had to eventually just say you know what. You know, we'll keep meta over there. I'll just keep calling this persistence and, you know, avoid the headache. And maybe one day we'll tackle, you know, what is a Metroidvania on one of these round tables? And <laughs> does a uh, driver one for a loop that way? Well, are, are things like Metroidvanias or, or platformers, are they designed with any sort of, of meta involved? Or is it all just, you know, the, be the best route to take? Or, or I um... think metas can, in those uh, realms, can spawn from speedrunners. Um, I think that when you have games with more of a customization aspect in them, like Mario Maker or Trackmania, Trackmania is one of those that just blows my mind because the meta is basically don't 
ever drive on the track as it's designed <laughs> to be driven. Um, it's bizarre. And I don't even know if meta is the right term to use there because it is. It's uh, speedrunners are just trying to break your game. Uh, it's a tough one. <laughs> Do we consider uh, speedrunning a part of a meta play these days? With people just super optimizing their runs for, you know, insane strategies. I would consider that a strategy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I see your point about strategy and meta and it being uh, conflated. Uh, certainly in my head. Because, you know, if you're, if it is strategy to, if, you know, the traditional meta of uh, looking at a card game and, and looking at how to, how to get that edge and, and get that 56% win rate, the deck with that. That is strategy. And it's hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, otherwise you go take the, the opposite argument to the extreme. You can say, well, my brain was operating um, at that time. So that was happening in the, meta, in the metaverse as opposed to in the game. Because my brain isn't in the game. <laughs> You know, before in discard, everything was math, language, and now everything is strategy. There is nothing else but strategy. Glitches, yeah, sequence breaks. And I guess uh, for my, like, final point, I think we can probably start wrap things up, because we're getting close to time anyway. But I guess, like, my final point, again, is that I think for a game that... You, as a developer, I think it is important to look at what people are doing, what are the popular trends, but you need to be very mindful of how much you fight against that. That if yeah. you purposely design, like, let's say everyone, oh, I remember one other example from Payday 2. There was a period that the meta became all dodge focus. So the entire high-end strategy was just, everyone just wear your normal business suits and have, you know, 80% dodge. And it completely invalidated all like armor and tank based strategies. And I think that is something the wrong way of designing it. Like we've said earlier, you do not want to design or put something in the game that intentionally or even unintentionally invalidates another strategy. Um, I think to what Seth was saying earlier, that you want to either you want to avoid nerfing, you want to buff everything so that it has viability. You know, I've said this before, you want everything to have a moment in the spotlight. It shouldn't be the perfect solution 100% of the time, but there should be a situation where, you know, option A, B, C, and D should be considered, you know, overpowered for their specific situation. But again, that takes a lot of foresight, and it takes, I think, a really strong, I guess, like, philosophy for how you want to balance and build your game. Well, even if you go back as far as, you know, Magic the Gathering, you know, there are crap rares. There are rares you'd never play or, or you know, even ultra rares or, or whatever uh, some of the other games had. Um, and certainly you don't want your commons to be too good. You want people to keep buying and, and purchasing and in the gotchas, you know, that's certainly the thing. But in something that's an eSport and uh, a free-to-play game, that's where it gets weird. The, the power creep, I mean. Mm -hmm. So that's actually a difficult balancing act that I don't know many companies that are pulled off. You know, League does it sometimes, right? Does it sometimes. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of complaining when the meta changes. A lot. I feel like that's, that's where uh, toxic community does play a big part. Not to say that they're all, they're all toxic, but you get a lot of complaints that are have very high value volume there. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the win loss binary in many cases creates a lot of toxicity in games, which yes, is absolutely. why uh, moving away from the win loss binary in our games. Yeah, I, I 100% agree that that is that is definitely a a cause. If you oh never, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say if you've never been to the Dead by Daylight forums, don't go to the Dead by Daylight forums, especially after a new patch. I was trying to, uh, we were talking about uh, ELO systems based on performance in the roguelike chat. And uh, I thought that, I was trying to push that through. 
as a concept, and no one was taking it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it, the idea of, you know, uh, if you're trying to, if, how do you make a game where everyone wins uh, without it being boring? It's, it's, it's really a, you know, something I've been struggling with for years. Uh, I, I, I create, uh, uh, my current project is both cooperative and competitive uh, with groups of up to 40 people on both sides uh, when you have a, a try versus try battle and how do, uh, how do I make that fair how do I make that fun and uh, and and so my objective is to basically let both sides win uh, based on their performance but but maybe there's there's different levels of winning instead of just you won or you lost and that way, uh, you know, maybe if you did better than the other team, even if you were a smaller team, uh, you know, then you get a bigger award. And I think, like, that goes kind of back to, like, one of the oldest uh, challenges of, like, the MMO style. Of how do you make uh, builds that aren't about direct damage interesting and exciting to play? How do you make the role of healer? this, you know, fantastic thing. Like, do you want to be the healer or do you want to be that guy who jumps out in front and, you know, slashes and destroys everything? And we've seen developers try all kinds of ways of making, I don't know what will be the right term, like the, I guess the, I guess like the uh, busy work jobs or like the, uh, <laughs> the management jobs more interesting or more worthwhile. And... To what Ramin was just saying there, it reminds me a lot of, again, like going back to Dead by Daylight with their meta. That the problem they have with their matchmaking is that it is entirely built on win-loss. Or how many, you know, people you hook as a killer, how many times you escape. But the problem is that, like, good play in that game is, you know, helping your teammates. It's about uh, crushing totems and stuff like that. And the game doesn't necessarily promote or really incentivizes that like you could be considered a horrible player in the matchmaking but that could be because you know you help every teammate and you you make sure every generator goes through or stuff like that like it feels like again like the focus on win loss as the meta kind of is pigeonholing that design that sounds like that horribly violent game i see people playing in the background while they're doing their youtube uh podcasts <laughs> where they're picking people up and they're killing people and then picking them up and then dropping them on hooks is that what you're you're talking yeah. about I did like. mm -hmm. yeah i've never played the game obviously but uh <laughs> now you I, I recognize it just from playing in the background when people are talking about things completely unrelated to that uh, <laughs> there's some reason why they have to do that because it makes it more interesting whatever they're talking about to have that play in the background or something i guess I focus so. on both things yeah, there's a lot of YouTube channels that are just gameplay footage, and you're talking about something completely unrelated over the gameplay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I am about out of topics. Again, uh, we can certainly segue into any other things, but I know we're coming up on time, so does anyone else here have any final thoughts, final points they would like to make before we kind of do our round-the-table wrap-up? I, I would just like I would just like to say that that if if AAA would spend half of their designing resources into making their games better instead of trying to make them more expensive, uh, we would have much better AAA games. Right now, all the the almost all the designing horsepower is going into trying to find ways to get more money out of players and not into making the game any better than the last iteration of the game. Uh, so you get, you know, X game 20, 21, you know, whatever, uh, uh, because they just, they haven't really improved the gameplay. They just figured out ways to make it more expensive every year. Uh, most of the design innovation is occurring in the indie space where they just still just sell you the game instead of trying to fleece you out of money every month. Uh, so um, since they don't have any, since they make their money based on you actually wanting the game, they put all their work into designing a better game. So you see all the design innovations right now coming out of the indie space, and they're just being stolen by AAA. It's, uh, I just wish we lived in a world where all that money and all that expertise was being used to make better games instead of more expensive games. All the shareholders. 
The job's not to make better games. The job's to appease the shareholders who want money. <laughs> and we're hearing all about like the old big like Ubisoft thing that's going on right now. With uh, was it Tencent is trying to buy out the uh, coming that their major investor in uh, Ubisoft. They're gonna have a fifty-four percent uh, controlling share. Oh boy. Well, I'm sure that won't uh, cause any major ripples or anything like that. <laughs> no, uh, I'm trying really hard to stay out of politics. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to get Rami in any more trouble. <laughs> <laughs> At the moment, Tencent is not really clamping down on all the crazy stuff that they could be. Um, you know, the new Dune uh, MMO, or mul I don't know if it's an MMO or just a multiplayer, is, you know, back, backed by, by Tencent. Fencom is 100% owned by Tencent. So, you know, the, I, I believe the same thing with uh, uh, the RTS. Now, granted, Chinese companies are under obligation to send all this data to the government. I don't know if that's going to apply if they only have uh, non-controlling shares. I don't know if they're going to do it. I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> Quite eager to see how that turns out. But we, we may not know because there, it's not like there's transparency about data collection, even in American companies. Yeah. Oh. All right, but I think with that, let us wrap things up uh, for our talk. And this was a really fascinating one. And again, for people watching, if you have any topics you'd like to suggest for a future roundtable, let us know in the comments. But as customary for these roundtables, I'm going to give everyone a chance around the room to uh, pitch or promote anything that they're doing, social media, etc. So I will go last this time. So we'll start with Rob, and once again, we'll work our way around. Um, I'm just getting back into social media a lot. So uh, I have a, a Twitter account that I just made, 4th Gen Robot. Uh, YouTube channel, finally getting some editing done this last weekend. So some content coming there. And, and 4gr.games is uh, the website that I'm also in the middle of building. So a lot to come. All right, down to Seth. I'm the, uh, the strategy informer on the web and, and on Twitter. My links will be down below. Um, in, uh, in, in beautiful card format. And, uh, you know, I do the, the reviews, the previews, I pitch games. Um, I tell people about great strategy games. Uh, and on the side, <laughs> I do consulting work for, for various indie development companies. So if you're looking for, for help in pretty much anything except for art, I can, uh, I can certainly work for you or work with you. All right, and Ramin? I am a co-founder of the gaming company Aravant, which is, we are a AAA uh, MMO transmedia company uh, that's making super social games where you can not only play with your friends, but actually make new friends. And uh, we're trying to bridge the gap between Web3 and Web2 uh, by taking the best of Web2 and the best of Web3 without all the awful stuff from web 2 like microtransactions and the awful stuff like web 3 which is I, I don't even get me started uh um our about half of our team is is pulled directly from the original core team from uh uh call of duty uh so we know how to make triple a games and uh we'd like to be the first triple a web 3 game all right and the game is called star garden <laughs> All right. And again, for me, if you're watching this, and I'm sure you at least know what this channel is, if you're new, do the liking, subscribing, and commenting. There's the information over there on the overlay for my Twitter, Patreon, and Discord. Support is always greatly appreciated. And if you want to hang out and talk game design and topics, uh, be sure to visit there. And again, uh, check out all my books. There are links down below. If you're going to uh, read the free-to-play book, buy at least 10 copies through the uh, 10 pools. Just keep doing multiple 10 pools on that one. That will help me out really well. <laughs> but uh, for these roundtables, we are trying to do them at least once a month. We have many different topics and many different panelists set up. And as always, if you're a developer and you would like to come on for an interview or for me to cover your game, 
reach out, Twitter, Discord, whatever. But, uh, gentlemen, that is going to do it. So, uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the talk. This has been a lot of fun. And we'll, of course, shout out on our Discord for our next one. But, um, as always, come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where he's in there on science of games. So, everyone, have a great rest of your night, and we will see you next time. Take care. Bye. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs>